Hello, and welcome to the next episode of The Brand Called You. The brand today is Dharti Desai. Dharti is a founder and CEO of several businesses. She's a trustee on the global board of Thai, as well as the long-serving president of Thai New York. She's also co-founder and ambassador of Animate Charitable Trust, very active supporter of women in business. I'm sure we are going to have a good conversation. Welcome to the show, Dharti. Thank you, Sandeep. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, likewise, well, the first question, I have known about some of your businesses, but you've been involved in so many different things. I wonder, let's start with understanding what is uh, currently your business interest? What kind of uh, companies are you operating? Um, currently focused on my marketing consulting business, which has been my core business since 1997. So still at it after many years. Uh, in between, like you pointed out, you know, did founder and CEO of uh, a few companies. Um, so my full-time, you know, focus right now is uh, building uh, my marketing consulting practice for growth stage companies. Uh, traditionally, of course, I was very involved in the direct marketing space, but over the years that's evolved. And so I've uh, also, you know, learned along the way and uh, pivoted, you know, and uh, like all of us do, looked at different opportunities. And so that's kind of my sweet spot. Uh, I'm also very actively um, helping uh, growth stage startup companies, either by investing um, and or advising, uh, which also has been, uh, you know, a time consuming uh, effort on my part for the last uh, eight years or more. Um, so yeah, and so then of course, time angel investing. Well. This is venture angel investing. investing. Angel investing. Yes, yeah. pure and, angel uh, investing. And and when you say marketing consulting, uh, do you mm -hmm. have a focus? And you did specify growth stage, but yes. is it uh, to help create uh, uh, like a brand? Is it to get their direct marketing going? Uh, do you have a particular focus, or is it uh, all of the above? <laughs> it is most of uh, all of the above, but I do come in as an extension of the founding team when right. they are at that sweet spot of, okay, we've got, you know, validation, uh, we've got product market fit early on, where do we go from here? How do we scale, keeping an eye on whether it's a revenue growth or, you know, uh, geographic growth, balancing the CAC and the LTV, uh, looking at all the data so far, where is the lowest hanging fruit? You know, what is a competitive landscape? So I come in more from a strategic uh, consulting standpoint and then help them execute. If they have their own team, then that works. I also have affiliate partners in the US and India that, you know, work with me um, in execution. So I'm more of, you know, a pure strategic consultant. That's kind of my role. And typically my engagement uh, starts at a one-year uh, retention and then it grows from there. I have some people that I've been working with for a while and I help them with uh, going to Series A and beyond. Um, and yeah, so that's pretty much uh, what I mean by growth stage, yeah. yeah. Not super you, early, you but you know, enough, enough out there for them to want to be able to work with someone who brings an outside perspective. So that's, a, that's interesting. You, you've helped companies all across uh, the marketing spectrum from brand building and direct marketing. Uh, maybe it'll be useful to talk about an example that you really enjoyed, where you engage with the company and and took through um, uh, through its journey. So so we get a real sense of how how this has worked for you. Absolutely, yeah. So um, there is a company in the um, ed tech space that um, basically was um, uh, at seed stage that came in. Um, initially, you know, looking for uh, more investments, you know, just raising money. Uh, but they had a big ask from a marketing perspective as well. So I joined the founding team and uh, basically now we are at, you know, Series A with that company. Similarly, a SaaS company also I have helped, uh, you know, go to market with. Um, opening doors from a, a business development perspective, uh, looking at their, you know, sales and marketing cycles, uh, bringing, you know, a big uh, ROI for them, uh, the analysis of it, 
and saying, okay, where, what are the channels that are working for us and what is not working and where do we focus? Um, the, the thing that I find, Sandeep, which is very interesting in uh, early growth stage companies is that somehow along the way, they haven't built a marketing model. Most of the startups have financial models that they you know, build out, but a lot of them don't have marketing models, right? So they haven't looked at what is the serviceable obtainable market space? What does it look mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. uh, and also because you know co competition for a lot of companies tends to be regional. They focus on what's you know in my uh, geography or in my neighborhood, and they forget the big world out there and what's happening. And and it helps eventually with the growth story, with your exit story, even. Uh, so that's one area that I really give a lot of research and insights in, which is the serviceable obtainable market, and then analyzing your CAC and LTV ratios. Right, where are you? Where were you historically? Where can you be and where, what kind of, because while, you know, valuations are great, uh, you and I know people have started looking at bottom lines very closely, right? So do we have the potential to be a profitable company? And I think that's where my background in direct marketing comes in very handy. Yeah, I'm able to very, you know, microscopically look at an ROI from a marketing spend perspective and see, okay, you know, whether it's digital, whether it's direct, it doesn't matter, right? Because at the end of the day, you're spending a dollar amount, you want a return on that investment, right? And it's no longer about just top line revenue and, you know, looking at your valuation, et cetera. So I, like I said, you know, for me, getting involved with the founding team is really uh, the sweet spot and it doesn't always work. Sometimes it works, you know, sometimes it does and because it's also the chemistry, right? Um, sure. whether the vision of the companies align, sometimes early stage companies, there's a fallout with founders, right? You know, it's very typical. It happens, you know, they run out of funds, which is also a huge problem. So just balancing all of that, you know, by saying, okay, look, this is very pragmatic. This is possible. This is not possible. And, you know, giving them a roadmap, which is tangible. And at the same time, you're measuring it along the way. And so where there's a team that appreciates it because either they're a frugal founder, they've you know, come the hard way, they understand it. These are founders that find value for it. And so I typically don't take on more than five, six engagements a year because it's a lot to handhold. And also, you know, you want to build that success story, right? So when they get to series A, it's so exciting. Okay, now what's next? But they've not thought of all of that. So helping with that marketing model and you know, just fine tuning it. I sit with the team for almost 90 days just figuring that out. Okay, what is it that we have done so far? You know, what are we doing and what can we do differently so that we actually bring revenue into the company? Uh, bottom line, that's that's the key. Yeah. That's the key. And, and, you know, we've gone through the cycle where everything was about eyeballs to now everything is starting to become about profit. So, so this is not an easy uh, task getting it right and communicating it to uh, the potential stakeholders on what is the model and why that makes sense. Exactly. Um, exactly. The, the other part of your time is in this global organization called Thai, the Indus Entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, you have several uh, roles. You wear many hats in that organization including being in its uh, global board and, and running its New York chapter. Mm -hmm. But most interestingly, I think you are uniquely focused on women uh, in business. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen mm -hmm. you lead programs and initiatives on, on that dimension. Mm -hmm. Tell us uh, why that passion, of course, you're a woman and you're an entrepreneur, so <laughs> you can some linkage, but yes. why yeah. that particular focus? And um, did, you, uh, did you face... Uh, any significant challenge being a woman entrepreneur? How did you overcome them? And why have you chosen to make this your primary focus? I love this question the most, Sandeep, because, and you're so right about everything that you observe, but I think for me, uh, so let me go you know, a little backwards. So first thing is, I have not had a disadvantage. I've never felt that as a woman, I was treated differently or I was shortchanged. I have not had that experience. Having said that, I am very aware that there are women who do feel that way. And there is no right or wrong. This is my personal experience. This is my personal journey. Uh, maybe it was because of the way I was raised in a very progressive family. Um, or maybe it was just me and my nature to kind of be the change I always seek. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I've always respected, for me, it's about humanity, right? Um, and when I have these conversations in different, you know, whether it's in the business world or in the not-for-profit world, in the investing world, it, I think around eight, nine years ago, and, and, you know, not to say that I haven't struggled in my life, I have personally and professionally, of course, but never as a disadvantaged woman. So that's something that I, you know, really do want to highlight, but across, you know, so many years and particularly in the last, I want to say 10, 12 years, I have come across women entrepreneurs who face some really unique challenges that I could not imagine that I could never have understood because I didn't go through it, but it's out there, right? And so I'm not even talking about the statistics. We all know that venture funding is, you know, for women-led businesses is less than 2% and the pandemic has become worse. We know all the stats that are out there, but just Mm -hmm. at a human level, for someone to not have representation, whether they come from a B town of India or they come from an underrepresented community in the US, you know, it's, it's, Uniform in that sense. So just having conversations and very similar to, you know, the conversations you have with entrepreneurs, I have just realized that, yes, absolutely, there's a need. And as an entrepreneur, what can I do? So it's not that I'm switching on my woman hat, but I would like to go and find these women. And so I'm very particular about what I'm doing and where I'm investing. At the end of it all, I am looking at them as an entrepreneur. They do have their challenges. But if I can make a difference by, you know, being an ambassador for some of these uh, causes, so whether it's Animade on my personal side, uh, you know, our trust, or whether it's Thai or Thai women for that matter, the idea was just to bring parity and then be able to say, okay, look, we have now enough representation and let the best person win. I mean, that's really been the underlying theme all along. Yeah. Uh, Look, I I have... uh seen this debate for many times and I'd love to hear your perspective on it. As you mentioned, you didn't feel any any disadvantage, but you have also experienced that many people do. Uh, what shape does it take? Is it, I, I, there could be two reasons why there is 2% funding. One is there are 2% women entrepreneurs, so there is 2% funding. Uh, or it could be there, sh- there can be, there is potential for 50% women entrepreneur, but there's only 2%. And it depends on what story you feel is closer that your worldview gets shaped. Uh, In your experience, what have you seen? What holds people back? What holds women back? Why are they underrepresented? In my mind, Sandeep, I think it's just lack of exposure, Um, whether it's at a individual level while you're growing up, mm-hmm. um, access to that exposure wasn't available early on. Um, technology, of course, has helped. And there are you know, great uh, companies doing great things, making great strides in this space and giving access to the smallest part of the world now where you can have that exposure, which you never had before. So if I have to talk about you know, uh, late 80s or early 90s where that wasn't available, it was definitely a lack of exposure. Today, when we do have that exposure, I think then it's the next step, right? It's the lack of execution. Um, it's, you know, sometimes the challenges um, come from, and not to say that a man doesn't have those challenges, whether they are familial or social or economic, but I think for women, it does tend to be a little more exaggerated mm-hmm. because of the lack of enough platforms that they can go and stand and say, okay, you know, this is what I have created, now I need some backup, whether it's a man investing or a woman investing, that's one, right? The other thing I do find, and I always ask, you know, anytime we have these forums, my one question that I lead with always is, hey, how many women-led companies have you invested in? And how many are you planning to invest in? Just, you know, to kind of do my own homework and say, okay, we're a group of 10 women. It's good to ask 10 women in your portfolio. And I'm talking about angel investors because that's the world that I'm most uh, uh, commonly found in, right? how many women-led companies have you mentored or have you invested in or have you seen, you know, them go from small to medium to large maybe or even small to medium? And this is still lacking. Right. It's it's not enough, you know, movement out there. So, and let's just assume for discussion that we're 50%. 
then our 50, you know, what percent of the 50% is actually investing in that 50%, right? Mm. Um, and I, you know, I love to, and so somebody has to ask me that back. And so for me, the mandate for the last five years has been, it, 75% of my portfolio has to be women-led companies. Mm. And, and I actively seek it out. And then I close the deal. And I, you know, whether it's I'm writing a small check or, you know, a slightly larger check, I do want that to be my kind of contribution, which is practical and it's not just theoretical. That's interesting. That's a tough metric to follow. Uh, when the universe is 2% and you're putting 75%, that's a hard, lot of hard work. Um, I know you have a daughter. What would be your advice to young women who are entering the world of business or corporate at this stage? What should they do? What should they focus on? So what I tell Anjali is what I'll share. Um, I, it's, and, you know, she laughs, but now I think she gets it now that she's out in the big world. My thing is show up. It's been my personal mantra. It's something that I hope, you know, that she picks up on and she's able to practice. Just show up. I, you know, this is something that has helped me. I'm, you know, the living proof of that. Showing up for the right reasons when you've committed to something showing up and it, again an observation and no judgment um, I do find that a lot of people fail to show up mm. and it could be a small gathering it could be a large you know convention it could be a networking event it could be an investment opportunity I could be the, the entrepreneur asking for funds I could be the investor investing in a startup showing up and then mindfully showing up whether you've signed up for 10 minutes or half an hour or one hour makes all the difference. It may not be right away. It comes eventually. Interesting. Participate, engage, more the opportunity to engage, more. You Stand by your on. commitments. Yeah. Whatever you're taking on, see it through, you know, don't jump onto something else before you finish closing the loop on something you started. I mean, that's, and it also helps educate yourself, right? I mean, the learning process, we are all, yeah. perpetual learners right um i think it really helps that tremendously yeah. you know by being there and closing the loop let's change gears uh, talk a bit yes. about your personal background where mm. did you grow up what was your early childhood like i was born in amdavad in gujarat um when i was 10 we moved to madras uh, it's known as chennai now so my middle and high school education was in uh, chennai and then i went to college in bombay Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Chennai, I uh, had a choice to pick a third language. And my very wise older brother said, pick French, pick French, because Tamil, you will not be able to read it. Um, uh, it's hard to read. At least French looks like English. And, you know, I'm sure he didn't know. Neither did I. I just fell in love with the language and I continued studying. I did every course that was out there for French. I was very fortunate, although I did do my undergrad in sociology in Bombay in Wilson mm -hmm. College. I continued with my French education, eventually became a French professor. And oh, I taught that French I didn't know about you. many <laughs> years. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know that. Yeah. And uh, I think for me, you know, being a teacher, being a professor was my earliest, uh, I call it my MBA because it taught me so much about entrepreneurship, independence, about, you know, being in an environment where you're a complete outsider. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I remember coming to New York, Sandeep and uh, going to meet the director in Manhattan uh, for the Alliance Francaise, which is on 60th Street, charming, you know, old lady. And uh, she said, you know, on the phone to me when I called and it was like day six or day five of being in this country. And I'm, this is 1993. And uh, she said to me, all in French, of course. And she said, I'm so sorry, we only hire native French teachers. And, you know, here you are, this Indian um, uh, Sorry about that. There was a call coming through. And, um, you know, I don't think we'll, and I had, you know, stacks of references and, you know, certifications and whatnot. And I said, you know, how about I just come and meet you? I'd love to become a member of the uh, Institute and, you know, I'd love to just meet you and see if there's something else I can do. And she said, sure. And she gave me a time. We talked for two hours. Mm -hmm. We talked for two hours and she didn't look at a single certificate she said, I'm so sorry, but this is just a policy that, you know, we cannot work uh, around. So I was, I said, okay, no worries. And I started looking at, you know, the New York Times uh, found an opening at uh, JFK at Air France for a passenger check-in agent. Mm. Took that on. It was only part-time. 
two days later, I get a call from Madame Mead to say, I have a class starting. It's this evening. It's only twice a week and it's beginner level. Do you want it? I said, yes, of course I do. I taught there for four and a half years. I was one of the busiest uh, professors of the Alliance. And I taught CEOs, actors, name it, you know, and I had so much fun. And I discovered New York City. And my first, uh, in, you know, introduction to an entrepreneur came because I was a French teacher. And then everything since has been just accidental, one after the other. That's a fascinating story. What a way to build it up. <laughs> What has been the most memorable advice that you got? Um, two pieces of advice that I've got, which sticks with me, is entrenched in who I am. Both happen to come from my dad. Uh, one was measure the worth of a man, and obviously man as in man or woman, by how he treats someone who can do nothing for him. That's one that, you know, I, and it works, it, it works for me, Sandeep, in, you know, my personal world, my professional world as well. And the second that, you know, which I understood much later was charity to the deserving. You know, make sure that whether you're writing a check or giving your time, it's to someone. And I never understood that. It, to me, I, you know, for me, charity was charity. You give money and, you, you know, that's it. And I have realized over the years that it's really about, you know, spending quality time with someone who appreciates it. And I've been on the other side. I've been a mentee as well. And I'm very respectful of my mentor and their time, but of my own time in that process, right? So whatever charity you do, whether it's money or time, you make sure that person really appreciates it and deserves it. Because you're taking away from someone who does deserve it, right? It's your time. We all have sure. limited hours. So let's, sure. you know, make it count where it matters. Yeah. You sign off your emails spiritually yours, which yes. is an unusual um, salutation or signature. Why? I'm an energy person, and mm -hmm. I I love energy that comes through uh, not when we meet physically, but even in our email tone or in our text. You know, so and it's good or bad; it doesn't matter. But for me, it's really about that energy that then converts to, I'm, I'm a spiritual person. I always have been. It's something that, again, you know, I, I inherited from my dad. Uh, it's also the ambiance that I grew up in. So I've always uh, been in the center of spiritual conversations. And that really, for me, is the guiding light in everything that I do. Um, even right now, when you and I are talking, just the way you're listening to me makes me do even better. Right. So mm -hmm. I, it's that whole spiritual connect and that energy it doesn't happen all the time because we're always in a hurry. It doesn't happen from my side. Sometimes I'm not mindful and not fully there. But this is me. And, you know, I, and I also like the fact that it gets conversations going. People always, you know, it's first thing. What is that all about? You know, so I like that part, too. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a good one because uh, it is important to a lot of people. And it's one of those topics that unfortunately people don't like to talk about openly. It becomes one of those closet topics that uh, people practice uh, privately, but never talk publicly. Uh, but you put it out there, so kudos to you. Thank you. Uh, we are going to close it out with some uh, uh, fun, short questions. There's no need to think. Whatever comes to your mind, you can blurt it out. Okay. Which movie can you watch over and over again? Um, Zindagi na milegi dobara. Okay. And I what's have watched it over and over again. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, yeah. What's your favorite uh, restaurant in New York City? It's a place called uh, Picola Cucina. It's on East 60th. Just Sounds love the energy yeah. there, the food, the people, the company, the ambiance. Love it. Yeah. Sounds Italian, is it? It is Italian, yes. What achievement are you most proud of so far? Of course, you have a long way to go. Achievement that I'm proud of in terms of business or just overall? Anything, it doesn't whatever matter. comes to your mind. My family. Being you know, who I am, a part of, whether it's as mother, brother, daughter, sister, you know, all of that, yeah. I think, yeah, my family is my biggest achievement. Very interesting. Uh, if you suddenly find yourself with a free afternoon, how do you spend it? 
Um, ideally, wine, music, and book. <laughs> All alone? All alone. Oh, I love my space. I really love my energy. And that's the spiritual part. And also, you know, spirit, quote unquote. So the wine is part of that. <laughs> <That's what Right. laughs> good, good, good. Spirit and spirituality together. Uh, that's yes. Good. Um, that brings us to the close, uh, that we can keep talking. Um, but I want to close with this question. In your own words, what is brand Dharti Desai? I think I'm an accidental entrepreneur for sure, but from a brand perspective, um, my brand is humility. I, I love that. My name suggests that as well. I'm a very grounded person, hopefully. So Dharti means earth or ground. Um, so that's me. That's my brand. Yeah, Keep my feet on the ground, but eyes, you know, always soaring and looking at the sky. Yeah, that's my brand. Stay grounded, but reach for stars. Wonderful. Yes. That's Sati Desai. Thank you for talking to us. Thank you so much, Sandeep. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience, and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website, www.tbcy.in, to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.